right. Hello out there. Um, poets, if you can hear me, will you give me a thumbs up? Upper Canyon poets. Hopefully there are a lot of other poets out there too. You could also put your thumbs up if you'd like to, but thank you. Great. Um, my name is Elena Ellis and I'm an editor at Copper Canyon Press and I am so uh, happy that you all are joining us out there. I see the participant count going up and up, which is thrilling. Um, we've already got over 113, 15, 17 people and counting and you're all so prompt. Um, I'm coming to you live from my home in Bellingham, Washington, which is up in Northern Washington just in a tangle of islands on the Salish Sea. And um, you may see one of my furry coworkers. This is Marigold the cat. <laughs> and uh, if we're lucky, you'll also see an appearance from Delilah the dog um, later in this event. Um, but thank you all so much for being here, wherever you are. We're getting ready for a live book launch reading. Um, this is gonna be an event with three Three contemporary geniuses. I heard Victoria Chang recently musing about what a genius is and I, I'm just gonna go ahead and assert that these are three of them. Um, we're gonna be hearing from Ed Skoog and Philip Metris and Victoria Chang in that order. Um, and they're gonna read from their gorgeous new and forthcoming books. Um, you're gonna hear from Ed's traveling or travelers leaving from the city and Phil's shrapnel maps and Victoria's obit. I'm gonna say Ed's title again because I edited that book and I should be able to say it correctly. <laughs> Travelers leaving for the city, which is something we don't do anymore. Um, but I trust we will do again, um, travel and go to the city. So this is our third of four launch party live streams from Copper Canyon Press in the month of April. And um, as an organization, we're pretty new to Zoom as are most of us out there now, um, although many of us are new to it and then now constantly on it. Um, but thank you for joining us in this experiment and we're just so pleased to be able to bring um, poetry into living rooms and share it with you. We're gonna try to broadcast this simultaneously on Facebook. There's been some kind of technological glitch where Facebook Live isn't streaming from Zoom. If we can't get that to happen, then we'll make sure to post it on Facebook so you can share it there, rewatch it. There'll also be a recording um, that'll be available on our website. Um, for those of you who are watching out there who have comments or questions for these genius poets, you can um, find the Q&A feature on Zoom and go ahead and type in questions. And if we have time at the end of the reading, then we'll <clears throat> answer some of those questions. Um, I also want to let you know if there are some of you who want to use closed captioning, we are um, going to be live captioning this event to the best of our ability and you just have to go ahead and enable that feature on your Zoom window. So as you may know, Copper Canyon Press is an independent nonprofit publisher and we've been dedicated entirely to poetry for 50 years. Um, and what you're tuned into now is our, we've called it our launch party live stream. And this is a way for us to just try to stay connected through this era of social distancing and during this time of crisis. Um, this is a way for us to launch these beautiful books that, you know, typically we go to AWP, the big conference, and launch our spring uh, collection of books. And this year we weren't able to go to that conference. We missed a lot of you there. Uh, many of our authors have had to cancel book tours and then many of the bookstores <clears throat> that we love so much are partners in book selling who we rely on to get those books into your hands. Um, most of them have had to shut their doors to the public during this time and so this is a way for us to still get the poetry to you and and get the word out about these brand new books. Um, speaking of bookstores, we assume that when you hear this poetry you're going to fall in love with it and you're going to want to um, bring it into your own home. <clears throat> and the great news is that a lot of stores, bookstores, even though they've had to close to the public, they've still found a way to ship to readers. And so um, many online or many independent booksellers are still doing online orders. And you can, you know, look for your favorite online and see if they're doing that. <clears throat> but we want to give you a few recommendations. Excuse me while I take a sip of tea. While I'm sipping my tea, <clears throat> 
And before I tell you about these bookstores, I just want to give a shout out to anyone who is sick and watching at this time. Um, obviously, there are so many people around the world who have fallen ill. Um, and so if you're home and you're recovering from coronavirus or or from anything else, um, or if your loved ones are, I just want to give you a shout out. I, I was sick this month and I, I'm so grateful to be better and be with you. Um, but I raise my cup of tea to you and wish you wellness. So bookstores. Um, first of all, I'm going to rattle some things off, but you can find a big hyperlinked list of bookstores on our website. Um, if you go to coppercanyonpress.org, there's a page all about the launch party live stream, and it has a whole list of bookstores that our poets have recommended. Um, but to list just a few of them, at Copper Canyon, we want to make sure to shout out um, our neighbors at Open Books and Elliott Bay Book Company. We got some woohoos out there from the poets. Um, both are still fulfilling online orders, and we hope you'll check them out. Ed Skoog has recommended, among others, Broadway Books. Broadway Books is in Northeast Portland, which is where I grew up. Shout out to Northeast Portland. Um, Phil suggests that you visit um, Max Books, which is located in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And Max is awesome. When we contacted them, they said that they'll donate a dollar from every purchase to Ohio-based literary nonprofits. So that's Max Books. And last but not least, um, Victoria recommends Bel Canto Books, which is in Long Beach, California. Um, so check these out and all the others listed on our um, website. And again, I encourage you to look up your own favorite bookstore and see if they're still shipping books to customers. Um, so while we're sharing the love, we want to say that we are so grateful to an entire community of people and institutions who um, support the arts and support Copper Canyon Press including during this time of crisis. So we have a volunteer board of directors who do incredible work on our behalf, a whole community of donors. Um, we have funders like the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture and For Culture, um, National Endowment for the Arts. All of those organizations have put out relief efforts to, to make sure that arts organizations can keep doing what we're doing because they believe that this work is vital. And I'm just so incredibly grateful. Um, if you're moved yourself to make a donation to Copper Canyon to keep uh, the effort of poetry publishing going during this time. Again, you can go to our website, coppercanyonpress.org and find the donate button. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, we have one more of these launch party events um, and it's next week and it's on Tuesday and you can find all the details on our Facebook, Instagram, website, Twitter, wherever you wanna look. Um, and I hope you'll join us for that as well. So for those of you just joining us, thank you so much for being here. You're at the Copper Canyon Press uh, launch party live stream, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's kick things off with our first reader, Ed Skoog. I'm thrilled to introduce you to him. Today, Ed will read from his brilliant forthcoming book. It's not quite out yet, but you can pre-order it, um, Travelers Leaving for the City. And Ed is also the author of three other books of poetry. Um, he, we're lucky enough at Copper Canyon to have published Ed from the beginning of his uh, poetry career. And um, one of his books, Rough Day, won the Washington State Book Award. Uh, Ed is originally from Kansas. He is, I understand, a visiting writer at the University of Montana. And he lives in Portland, Oregon. Please welcome, with your wild applause at home, Ed Skook. Thank you, Elena. Can you hear me? Am I, can you hear me? You can hear me fine. Not too quiet. Great. Uh, thank you for putting this together, everyone at Copper Canyon, and for putting out this book. And it's nice to be here with Philip and Victoria. Very honored. Uh, I'm thinking. I'm just looking at the participant list and saw so many names of people that I wish were uh, were here in the room. Other writers and readers that I know and family members and friends. Uh, so uh, greetings to everybody. We're doing pretty good here. Uh, we hope that you're doing well too. Uh, I'd like to read um, a selection of poems from uh, Travelers Leaving for the City. Pittsburgh. 
isn't there anymore, rode by it on the gray horse, and instead a place where they go sick, a place of only mist. To properly understand the 12 Pittsburghs of the heart, but nothing to grasp or die for. Oops, that wasn't intentional. Just trying to fix the audio in my own ear. That's not part of the poem, but it could be. It'd be a pretty good part. I'm just trying to fix the audio in my own ear. To properly understand the 12 Pittsburghs of the heart, but nothing to grasp or die for. When the adults told me to cry, I sang on the uneven riser, which swirls like northern lights in my ear. In 1955, my mother's father, a steel worker, was shot and killed in his hotel, intervening in a, a, an abduction attempt. The shooter crazed and lovesick, according to his mother. My mother only met him, her father, a few times. The last time, shortly before the murder, she said she took a train. In the testimony of another tenant, his face, after staggering out of the apartment, burned an iron color. He fell into her arms. I was holding him, trying to help, she said, but he was dead. The kidnapper escaped with his ex, and they drove the outskirts of Pittsburgh, Tarentum, Aspenwall, Turtle Creek, all night before she talked him into turning himself in at dawn. Clouds are in a composition useful to fill space around the invisible. In moonlight, the murderer and the owl who buries and the bull who rings drove rural Allegheny County, stopped at midnight for hot dogs and milk, according to the transcript. I suppose he sang like a scarf gone out long behind, like magnetism, like thorn bushes, like wind around a highway sign. He went up and asked if anyone was dead again. Why they need to assert themselves, even after we told them about sorrow. I think my grandfather's ghost rode alongside them 11 miles, peering in before departing. Who wasn't with him the night he was killed? Like hearing a stranger's headphones in the spirit of canceled flight and the storm coming. She missed the beard he was growing. We put our gods in clouds. We hide in clouds. That poem kind of lays out the initiating subject for the book, which is the, the um, murder of my grandfather in 1955, obviously before I would have known him. And that absence in my mother's life and my investigation or curiosity, a repression of how that violence, how what came before and the silence that came after it, affected the way that she helped mold me and my relationship to language and um, the world. Uh, and uh, after working on this book and thinking about it for many years, I don't know anything more about it than I did when I started, but um, along the way I wrote some words. And that made me think of other things, other hotels, other losses, other um, silences, other relationships between violence and language and place. Uh, this poem is called The Portland Water, which is the name of a song by Michael Hurley, um, but is also the name of the water company for Portland, Oregon, where I am speaking to you from, as far as you know. The Portland Water. The gasoline of mowing brings rosemary into the noon. Children are picking their noses, telling each other about skin color and pretending their parents are dead. Far away, Porky Pig is peeling wallpaper with a lotus egg and the dog dog paddles in his sleep. There is swimming in the river now, some thrown rock side saddles to the bottom. Suicides return in long boats, walk around for an hour. The sun is working at its sunglass hut. An invisible escalator is running in my head, which is called desire. Out here where the gravel is, the mimosa's long feathery branches with confectionery frill, tranquil in its dry way, out here where the gravel is, walled and unwalled cities of grief, cities you hold, indifferent city. Curbless streets potholed down to truck, tarp broken boat, 
the dumpster left over, a renovation that faltered. Crowds of teenagers are necessary. The shit they break needs breaking, out here where the gravel is. The world is a falling room. What sand thoughts my sleep? Rolled me into curtains. Show no draw, and yet night's shell has broken open my son, who climbed into bed. Where is he now? Not every night do I look down the ledge, but there he is on the floor. And I am the one who lifts him like a helicopter flying a bladder from the lake to drop on the fire. I'm the fire, burning home in the dark for anything broken or bruised. The shit they break needs breaking. I stay awake and plan the day ahead out here where the gravel is. There's a short poem called Famous Monsters. There was a magazine called Famous Monsters of Movie Land that I um, collected uh, along with other kind of, you know, monster magazines, movie magazines, comic books, and then lost somewhere along the way. Famous Monsters. As the hand that holds the gun is a stone, diamonds are embedded in. As the wine pours cold into the thin glass, as rain slides along icicles, as wrens in bushes, as when I say good morning and they say nothing, as knives on their magnet silhouette, riders on the top of a hill, there are signs at the airport, there are signs, always, the moment is always, and the dead step into it as into a bodysuit, as into a shower. Now I'll read a last poem that's a little long called uh, Timothy McVeigh at the Dreamland Motel. In thinking about the murder of my grandfather, I ended up actually thinking more I, perhaps about the murderer. His name was Russell Winterbottom. And I was able to kind of trace his short life um, afterwards and what led up to it. He and my grandfather were both combat veterans. And that's all I know because they were, they have that, they had that distinction. That's a, some of the, the only facts I was able to find about them. Um, there's a, one of the, the most important texts I know of in poetry are the letters between Denise Levertov and Robert Duncan, as well as, you know, the, the poetry of Denise Levertov and Robert Duncan, but they had this long correspondence and they eventually fell out at, in a quarrel about the Vietnam War, which Levertov and her husband actively um, opposed and resisted and, you know, put their bodies on the line and got arrested and, you know, organized and wrote a lot about it. And Duncan um, didn't, and, and he didn't really understand why a poet would do that sort of thing. He didn't, I think, see a division between poet and citizen. Um, and in his, his argument to Levertov was that uh, the, the job of the poet is not to resist evil, but to imagine it, which like most of Duncan perplexes me, baffles me. Uh, I disagree with him, but it's, oh, it's, it got under, under my skin and, and animated a lot of this book. And so this poem is about Timothy McVeigh um, an unpleasant fellow who uh, uh, was at least one of the people who performed the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Timothy McVeigh at the Dreamland Motel. You must tear yourself up entering room 25. The way children were torn apart, blasted in the daycare. And it seems I must say it over and over to myself that he intended to. He intended to kill the children and not see the killing, and took pains to avoid being hurt himself, who was once a child and got away. As one survivor tells how pinned beneath concrete so tight she couldn't spit out her gum, she held an unseen hand, disconnected, and although the detail is grotesque, she said it was still part of the real person, and I am holding your hand into the smoke to be changed by events holding my own child's hand at crosswalks, in parking lots, in public places where danger is disorder, 
a break in the pattern that conceals us like a snail in its shell. Which delicacy is strongest, slug or snail? A metal slug is a round bullet. It spins like a planet in, bringing the morning. Timothy McVeigh rose and slept, just like you and me. And if there is a soul, had a soul. And if there is no soul, had no soul. And so it is with you who doesn't want to read or hear about Timothy McVeigh any more than I want to write, be talking to you about him. But here he is, striding toward the getaway car the moment there is a blast. And don't you feel waves pushed at you in that sunlight, how it cleaved the day? He only got so far without license plates pulled over for the infraction and caught. When enthusiasts talk about freedom of the road, that distance is part of it. The highway miles, he was nobody. Like the midnight roads, the murderer of my grandfather rode before turning himself into police. You may be allowed to tear yourself up like a ticket, entering into the world of bombers, the explosive avenues and rigged doors, and want to turn for peace to beauty as a badge that you might be known for your goodness. He registered for the room as Bob Kling, but tore it up and put his real name. He talked the manager down to 20 bucks a night instead of 28. The rider van may or may not have been parked there. Still, it is uncertain what happened in what order as often is the case when the sluggish estuary of language washes into memory's current. My real name is Ed Skoog, but I dreamed another name, which is a window with a window inside it and a ladder and a ball and two arms reaching. And because I drew it once and tore it up and threw it in the fire, I tear myself up when entering a room with a poem in it because a poem is meaning. And whenever you pay your $20 and step into the 25th room, there is a poem on the table, which is too horrible to read. And you read it, the 168 names, the words for their lives, I have seen them, their photos on a grid, but in the room, I lay down on the carpet and dream them also. They are dreaming and wake up, shower their bodies, which certain traditions say are the vessels for the soul. And they brush their teeth with assorted toothbrush styles and the toothpaste brands they have come to prefer. They shave, they comb, they protest the comb. They go downstairs and have breakfast. They run to the bus without breakfast. Their lunches are packed. They are planning to go to lunch. They are government workers. They work for the government. They are the children of workers. The children are learning new words each day. In Junction City, the voices are waking too. The clerks and the neighbors, the owner's son who tells the driver of the yellow bomb he can't park it by the swimming pool, only by the sign. The taxi driver who said he didn't give him a ride and then okay, he did. The bomber peeled back the plastic of his ID and burned the paper and the next day showed it to arresting officers. He ate a fruit pie. He is throwing the wrapper straight on the ground. They are weighing buckets of nitromethane on a bathroom scale out by the lake. They are slitting open the ammonium nitrate. They are pouring fuel into barrels. I am mixing the racing fuel, uh, the white fertilizer pellets turning bright pink. I seal them up. I affix the blasting cap, connect the long fuse. I do this every day. I wash my face, I brush my teeth, I wash my hair with anti-dandruff shampoo, I cleanse myself before stepping in today and coax my son down to breakfast, I am pouring cereal, I am pouring milk. We talk about what dreams we had. The Dreamland Motel's been raised, its iconic sign installed at the museum in Oklahoma City brought inside to light a room with its neon star, its Vegas lettering. The movable letters read, welcome. The bombing fell at Easter. He was executed a little after Lent with intravenous drugs. And then one part became president and won the fight against it. The same as day that covers the memorial bloodless and bowed. It was bullshit that drove him to do it. And the same nobility he claimed to feel is inside the language now that I am using. This sentence has a fuse. You must tear up a poem that you enter. And the sound of the tearing rhymes with allowance and defeat he had a poem read at his killing, one that has given comfort to many. He was comforted by a poem. Torn and burned, drowned, thrown far. The bombing victims worked for the government of the United States. They died working for it. And now, a day's half the time, I want to give up and say the deal's off. 
The thick mire slog to be is too slabbed to brain. Asleep in room 25, the highway loud and the bombing practice at the fort nearby, a tender and a lullaby thunder. The pillow thin and spring's menthol drifts in the open window, prairie insects legging the screen, lace wing, blister beetle, medicine moth, flesh fly, bombardier beetle, and the false bombardier beetle, which has no bomb. And when I wake, I may still be there, the terrible truck outside. And even then, and this is what facing the ghost tells the dreamer, what the false bomber sings to its cousin. I may walk into the last hour, keyless, into the last minute, may step towards the beautiful cowardices of love. Thank you very much for letting me read these poems to you. I hope they are uh, interesting enough for you to think about purchasing the book through one of the methods Elena outlined previously. Broadway Books in Portland, for example, Raven Bookstore in Portland, Open Books. Uh, send me a note and I will send one to you. Um, imagine it, draw one out of a well, however it is that one acquires books in these strange days. Uh, I don't know how to stop because I can't hear anybody and uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> the nature of Zoom. Um, but uh, I'll thank you and then I'll mute myself forever. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Please don't mute yourself forever. Uh, but do mute yourself for right now. <laughs> um, Ed, was that the 12 hearts of Pittsburgh that showed up across your heart chakra? Uh, <laughs> That's uh, during your reading. I leave that to, to you. <laughs> I choose to say yes. That's what happened is that Ed read the line, the 12 hearts of Pittsburgh and the hearts showed up mapping across his chest through a miracle that transcended um, time and space. That's, that's how I interpret, that's how I read that moment. Yeah, that's, um, that's it, that's pretty much it. Okay, great. Um, feel free to, I see some people are, are um, adding questions, feel free to write your questions for Ed in the Q&A and we'll get to some of those at the end of the reading. Um, thank you for that beautiful reading. Uh, I appreciate always the um, the beauty and horror that can um, intertwine in places in your poems, and um, because isn't that you know what we deal with uh, every day, especially right now? Let, let me just quickly also thank you, Elena, for your work, your help with me on these poems. Mm -hmm. um, it was in, I couldn't have written them without, couldn't have, they wouldn't have found their final form without your close reading and, and uh, uh, incisive uh, editorial genius. Thanks, Ed. What, what an honor. Um, thank you and thanks everyone for listening at home. I am now excited to take a deep breath and introduce our next reader. I really do need a breath though, so I need to do that. Um, our next reader is Philip Metris and um, Phil is new to Copper Canyon Press, although he is uh, a prolific author. He's the author of 10 books. Um, he'll be reading to you from Shrapnel Maps, which is um, his forthcoming book this spring. Um, but he is a, an author whose poetry is wonderfully textured and cross-genre itself. Um, but his published work includes, in addition to his own poetry, translation, essays, fiction, criticism, scholarship, um, he's a professor of English and the director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Program at the John Carroll University. And he lives in Cleveland, Ohio with his family. So please um, welcome, welcome Philip with your wild applause at home. Thanks so much, Elena. I'm just so grateful to be part of this reading. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks to the whole Copper Canyon family for welcoming me. You know, Michael, John, Elena, Emily. Um, Laura, it's just been a great experience, uh, despite the pandemic that we're all sort of, in, you know, kind of enduring right now to know that, you know, my book is, um, is real and will be shared and will be considered because that's all we want as, as, uh, as writers. Um, it's good to imagine you uh, out there, listeners, uh, inexplicably there and here. And I hope that you can imagine me even as you see me as uh, inexplicably here and there as well. Um, 
I, I don't really have anything coherent to say about the present moment except um, that uh, we need kind of connection even more than we, we, we've ever needed it. And this whole uh, terminology of social distancing to me um, misses the fact of social connectivity, which is uh, so much more important. Physical distancing, social nearing maybe. So hopefully that this will provide some of that social nearing. This is a book that's taken me about a decade to kind of finish. Um, after writing about the Iraq war and sand opera and about Russia in pictures at an exhibition, I thought I would choose something a little less controversial. Um, so I picked the uh, Israel-Palestine predicament. <laughs> um, needless to say, it, it led to many sleepless nights as, as I endured a kind of journey to attempt to understand um, the nature of this place that two people both claim that have deep stories to and that, um, that have very strong feelings about. I am from an Arab American family. I um, also live in a Jewish Orthodox neighborhood here in um, outside of Cleveland. And so quite frequently I'm thinking about and sometimes talking about the issues that belong to that over there space, which so many people consider um, deeply part of their own hearts. And um, if you read the book, you'll sort of go on a journey with me as I attempt to uh, abide with really different points of view and experiences and, um, and realities. And um, that's one way that I think in some ways this book speaks to our current predicament, which is that we're all enduring this pandemic in different ways and experiencing it differently. The first poem is called Family. At the Catholic University, a speaker clicks through slide after slide of barbed wire, cattle shoot checkpoints, and walls. His mantra, occupation. What threatens the Christians, he concludes, is what threatens Palestinians. A woman stands up. I wanted to let everyone know, she says, that this talk was full of spin. I can't see her, she's behind me, I'm afraid to look back. The truth is the opposite. My heart goes out to her, standing in the heart of another country. The reason for the wall was that people were being attacked, she says, by terrorists. After all, the Arabs sold the land. It was too much trouble. I sink back in my seat. And at a Catholic school, you should know what the church has done, especially during World War II. Then a man gets up. I can't see him. He's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The Jews bought a tiny bit of land, but the rest, the rest was stolen. My heart goes out to him, standing in the heart of another country. But, he says, they did not buy everything, even if they buy Congress. I shrink again. She says, you have 14 Arab countries. Can't we have just one? They should take you in. He says, but this is our land. Why should we have to leave? Because Europe took it from us? That is why we fight. What about peace, someone mumbles. He says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side continues to eat? She says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side is trying to stab you with knives? It goes on like this for a long time, years, decades, generations. I sit like a child at the table, watch parents grip utensils, spit words like shrapnel. I hate how I love them. Ashamed, I look down, unable to bury the hot metal. One tree. They wanted to tear down the tulip tree, our neighbors, last year. It throws a shadow over their vegetable patch, the only tree in our backyard. We said no. Now they've hired someone to chainsaw an arm, the crux on our side of the fence, and my wife in tousled hair and morning sweats marches to stop the carnage mid-limb. It reminds her of her childhood home, a shady place to hide. She recites her litany of no, returns. Minutes later, the neighbors emerge. The worker points to our unblinded window. I want to say, it's not me. 
slide out of view behind a wall of cupboards, ominous breakfast table, steam of tea, our two young daughters now alone. I want no trouble. Must I fight for my wife's desire for yellow blooms when my neighbor's tomatoes will stunt and blight and shade? Always the same story. Two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. As with the baby brought to Solomon, someone must give. Dear neighbor, it's not me. Bloom shadowed, light deprived. They lower the chainsaw again. This book takes us on a journey from University Heights to Israel to Palestine. Um, one of the things I really wanted to do was also center voices of people who've been working for justice and peace in a variety of ways. And this third poem, Marginalia with Uprooted Olive, is dedicated to Imad Bernat, who was a farmer and Palestinian farmer and activist who fought the uh, separation barrier that had blocked him from his, um, his olive trees in Berlin. I'm looking over here because our dog insisted on coming into the room right now. Um, he's a very sweet dog, but he's, um, I think he wants to go out now. So um, my wife is gonna let him out. All right, marginalia with uprooted olive for Imad Bernat. The margin is not the margin to the margin. Above the drone trails a sound like a mower cutting the sky. You look up, precedence for seizure, stand with fellahin and land in prison. In the margin to turn outside is to riddle the inside, congratulation din. You stake your right stalk and scrawl across the white lawn of law. They write, you gone old weed, you will not leave your stony margin, your Roots like limbs claim horizon. And this is for Ezra Nawi. This is the second part of Demolition Diptych. Ezra is both um, Arab and Jew, a queer activist, human rights activist, working with Palestinians whose houses are being demolished for being constructed in the so-called uh, Area C in the West Bank. For Ezra would dive beneath the half-demolished shell of a house, as if to stave off what has already happened, ghost of where and what he is, Jew and Arab, standing among Arabs who can't understand why their house must fall and why the bulldozer's teeth must sink into its chest, a lung collapsing. On the video you hear Ezra's adrenaline gasping, in trembling hands the soldier binds and plastic cuffs tighter and then tighter again. Why are you tightening them? The soldiers laugh. Is it funny the kids will sleep outside? And the only thing left here is hatred. And I did what my heart told me to do. And I will lodge an immediate appeal for Ezra in Hebrew means help. This is the second to last poem, and I'm gonna ask my wife, Amy Bro, to uh, assist me with this. This is a poem that's a blackout of Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad. Here's, here's my beautiful wife. Uh, this is uh, on page eight for those following in their hymnals. Um, Ark in. in. No man are absurd, the prophecy has been fulfilled in a verse from the Bible, and I have quoted, and I have secured the phrase, all the kings, it was always to my attention in the moment because it was something that a vastly, vastly different, different home. Home. significance from what I can see I easily. Home. I can see easily enough that it, between the papa, that it's hard to, as the matters of interest, I, I must, must learn a great I'm many things. Great many I things. have learned somehow that concerning, concerning Palestine, Palestine. I, must I must begin, begin a system, system of, reduction. of reduction, like my grapes of the spies that Out I have. The promised land, we did something like that. The word Palestine always brought to my mind. The United States, I don't know why. So, large, so, a so large a history. I think that was something. So, no, no, no. Thank you. All right, well, that's telling me to stop. I do have one more poem. Thanks so much, Amy. 
Um, thought I would end with a, a love poem. Since this book is really about relationships, how we belong to the earth, how we belong to, to land, and how we belong to each other. Um, and that's it. So here's, here's this little love poem. You there between things and the words for things. For a taste of your mouth, I forsake gorging, for giving this my body, your body, always but suddenly, between things and the words for things. For your shining eyes slide over my nighted sight. I want to dispel the delusion of separation, almost enough to shatter the glass of self. Forgive our body always but suddenly, there is this singing, this inexplicable turning as bird follows spring. It's translucent skull tuned to gathering light. And though I tunnel mute, this tongue works a small space open with one wet wing. So thanks, this is my book. 193 participants, bless you all. You're beautiful. I can't see you, but you're beautiful. Thank you so much, Philip. Would you do me a favor and show the, that, that uh, poem on page eight so people can see the visual? This book is full of visual representations of the poetry. Thanks. So that duet, which was brilliant, by the way, um, <laughs> um, that was like an example of the sweet brilliance of quarantine creativity, <laughs> right? Your wife gets to come in and uh, perform a redacted poem with you. Yeah. Um, but this book, Shrapnel Maps, I'm excited for everyone to get a physical copy because it is, it's full of um, all different kinds of ways for the page to represent what it means for multiple cultures to uh, it intertwine and collapse and be in conflict. There's, there are, um, you know, artifacts represented there. Um, really physically beautiful, which is also a hallmark of Phil's work. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I would say that actually all three of the poets today, these books are really to be discovered physically, um, as well as in these readings, the forms are really important. Ed's got a lot of um, movement and trains and maps, I would say on the page and, and Victoria, um, you'll hear about her poems and you'll hear the poems themselves soon, but um, Thank you, and thank you too, Phil, for bringing spring into the reading. Um, and I had this this um, image come to mind as you were reading that poem, the poem about the tulip tree and the tomato garden. I'm really, I always really feel that poem, but I really feel it right now because there's very literally, you know, the magnolia trees blossoming here and the gardens being planted. Um, but I just had this. I hope this sounds um, interesting and not hokey, but I, I had this image come to mind that these books um, that are being published this spring were all planted last spring. So all the authors had to turn in their manuscripts about a year ago. And um, like one of the sweet things about gardens, we're just starting a new garden here at my house, but like if you've had a garden cultivated, I imagine it's really sweet right now during this crisis to go out and find things that you planted, you know, previously showing up right now when you really need them. And um, similarly, it feels like we, you know, you all did this work and we did this work uh, to put these books in motion. And then here they are, these beautiful, you know, objects of this work um, that's not about a pandemic. <laughs> and um, it's about other really important things in the world and life. And I'm really just grateful that that artwork was seeded and came to fruition this season. Um, so thank you again, Phil, for your beautiful uh, reading. Thinking. Absolutely thrilled. And like, I, uh, you know, like, you all just accepted a huge <laughs> <laughs> Like This is my London calling or my Sandinista, maybe. Uh, it's just ridiculous. So I just really appreciate the graciousness and the generosity with which the press has handled um, a really big, thick, project. So, and I can't wait to hear Victoria now. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I too can't wait to hear Victoria. Um, our last reader today is Victoria Chang. Victoria will read from Obit, which is her brand new book, which I think officially 
published last week. Um, it's, it's brand, brand new in the world. Um, the New York Times has recommended and reviewed it. It's been mentioned there twice in the last couple of weeks. Um, she is uh, also the author of other books, including Barbie Chang, which came out from Copper Canyon Press. She's the author of children's books. Um, she does all kinds of things. She also is the program chair at Antioch University's Low Residency MFA program, which is my alma mater. Um, and she lives in Los Angeles with her family. And very importantly, although they are not in the frame with us, her wiener dogs, mustard and ketchup. Um, and I hope, I don't know, I hope somehow we get to hear a little bit more about them today. Victoria, uh, please welcome Victoria Chang with your wild applause at home. Thank you. I'd rather talk about my wiener dogs than read my poems, I have to be honest. Um, Thank you so much, everyone who had a hand in, in making this. I know that so much work goes into a seemingly simple event like this. And um, so I just, I appreciate that. And thank you to the whole Copper Canyon crew. I know there are a whole bunch of you. Um, thanks to Ed and Philip. It's such an honor to read with you um, and to everyone watching. So I'm just gonna read three, four, five, seven poems of which two are really short ones um, in the middle. And I'll just give you like a quick um, summary of, of the book, I guess, if you can really summarize it. But um, my mom passed away in 2015 of, uh, it's called IPF, it's in pulmonary fibrosis. And it's pretty much when your lungs um, scar and uh, you gradually suffocate to death. And I didn't really want to write elegies. I felt that that was um, going to be a really difficult process and also a bit cliched. Um, and then I was driving one day and um, listening to NPR and a person had made this really great documentary called Obit on obituary writers. And just something about that, um, that word really triggered me to go and uh, home and just for two weeks straight kind of write 70 ish of these things which are they look like oh like newspaper obituaries um and you know i just noticed that when someone that you care about dies everything dies um in many ways including yourself and so i'll just start reading a few of these this one's called memory memory died august 3rd 2015. the death was not sudden but slowly over a decade I wonder if when people die, they hear a bell, or if they taste something sweet, or if they feel a knife cutting them in half, dragging through the flesh like sheet cake. The caretaker who witnessed my mother's death quit. She holds the memory and images, and now they are gone. For the rest of her life, the memories are hers. She said my mother couldn't breathe then took her last breath 20 seconds later. The way I have imagined a kiss with many men I have never kissed. My memory of my mother's death can't be a memory, but is an imagination. Each time the wind blows, leaves unfurl a little differently. This one's called Friendships. Friendships died June 24th, 2009, once beloved, but not consistently, consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I am now imprisoned in the mirror. All my selves spread out like a deck of cards. It's true, the grieving speak a different language. I am separated from my friends by gauze. I'll drive myself to my own house for the party. I will make small talks with myself, spill a drink on myself. When it's over, I'll drive myself back to my own house. My conversations with other parents about children pass me on the way up the staircase and repeat on the way down. Before my mother's death, I sat anywhere. Now I look for the image of the empty chair near the image of the empty table. An image is a kind of distance. An image of me sits down. Depression is a glove over the heart. Depression is an image of a glove over the image of a heart. It's really strange to read to a screen. <laughs> okay. This one is called Caretakers. 
caretakers died in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, one after another. One didn't show up because her husband was arrested. Most others watched the clock. Time breaks for the living eventually, and we can walk out of doors. The handle of time's door is hot for the dying. What use is a door if you can't exit? A door that can't be opened is called a wall. On the other side, glass can bloom. My father is on the other side of the wall. Tomatoes are ripening on the other side. I can see them through the window that also can't be opened. A window that can't be opened is just a see-through wall. Sometimes we're on the inside as on a plane. Most of the time we're on the outside looking in, such as doggy daycare. I don't know if the tomatoes are the new form of his language or if they're simply for eating. I can't ask him because on the other side, there are no words. All I can do is stare at the nameless bursting tomatoes and know they have to be enough. And I should have probably mentioned my father is, um, has dementia and he had a stroke maybe about 12 years ago. And so um, I write a lot about him and he's a, still a big part of my life. So I, f I forget about that sometimes. Um, so then I, I wrote a whole bunch of these and then kind of um, ran, ran, I just dried, just dried out. And so I started writing these other um, poems and forms and just practicing, you know, just keeping language moving. And I wrote sestinas and guzzles and all sorts of things. And I started writing these tankas, um, which are, uh, you know, Japanese form, kind of like a haiku, but they're five lines and it's five, seven, five, seven, seven for a total of 31 syllables. And so um, I paired a whole bunch together and they ended up to be tankas, uh, you know, for all children really. And they, they're just like on a page like that. So I'll just read uh, four of these and they're each together. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming as they touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. And here's two more of these, and then I'll read two more poets. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. Let's read two more obits. It's 353. Okay. Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other, lesser deaths. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The texts kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor, of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky. That is grief. Need one more. This one's called um, the blue dress. The blue dress died on August 6, 2015, along with the little blue flowers, all silent. Once the petals looked up, now small pieces of dust I wonder whether they burned the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. 
I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what sound the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral, too black. She looked like a comic character. I waited for the next comic panel to see the speech bubble and what she might say, but her words never came and we were left with the stillness of blown glass, the irreversibility of rain and millions of little blue flowers. Imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. I want to read you this comment from one of the audience members that says, I'm so grateful that you're reading, Victoria, and sorry you can't hear the gasps, see the tears, see the nods in agreement, the smiles and gratitude. So you're reading to a screen, but you're reading to all of those responses as well. I also heard um, from my colleague that um, that's did broadcast on Facebook Live at the same time, so we want to thank the hundreds of people who are watching on Facebook as well as here on Zoom with us. And um, uh, we do, are you all up for a couple of questions, a couple of Q&A questions? All right, let's do it. Um, there are some just no questions, but yowza, go on forever, gasp, weeping. Um, <laughs> I'm not making this up. These are some of the comments. Um, but there, is, there are a couple of questions about form. So I'm wondering, um, any of you can answer this. Uh, the question is, how, how do the poems find their various forms? It's a big question, but maybe answer it in whatever small way you can. Whoever wants to start. I'll start. I mean, for me, I think, and I always say this, that form is a big part of my, my process. And you know, I, I think of it as, a, as a, a vase or a vessel in which the poem sits. And, you know, sometimes the vessel has no physical boundaries, but I feel like the poem doesn't feel right to me until it's found that form, whatever that form is. And um, yeah, so for this particular book, it was, you know, the Tankas and in the middle, there are these sort of weird sonnets that have a lot of um, sejuras and in various spaces and things in the obit, obviously. So um, for me, it just, I, I, it's just kind of like clothes for me. So I need them in order for the, the poems to, to work and to continue. And just to give a really specific example, the first poem I read, Family, is actually a kind of hyben, which is a, a form that involves sort of a prose anecdote followed by a haiku at the end. And um, I, I needed just, I felt that it was a prose poem because it was, uh, it had a kind of narrative and dialogic element to it that, that just seemed right in prose. Um, but I, I needed a really big pause between the words hate and love at the end. And then suddenly I thought, oh, I, like I should just figure out how to slow it down to bring it into lines at the very end. I hate how I love them. And um, so, the poem didn't arrive until that the form announced itself as an option to me. Um, so that's just an example of form finding the poem and uh, with the poem wouldn't have worked. It, it only happened after I read it and realized ah, there needs to be more of a silence for the reader to take in this paradox or this contradiction. And uh, so that, that's just one example. I could talk for ages about it, but I'll just leave that. Thank you. I love uh, <clears throat> talking about form and, and prosody, even though I'm, I'm not a formal poet, but I, I love the, uh, the nature of form to really be about repetition, um, various kinds of repetitions, visual repetitions, sonic repetition, rep but more importantly, as a figure in the mind, repetitions of thought returning you know, going away, coming back. The poem on a page is about the size of a face. And I think that there's something about a poem that is like a face. Um, and in this poem is kind of, this book, a lot of the poems are kind of projective. They're around the page. And one of the things I was, I wanted to to encapsulate is some of the the, the friendliness and immediacy of speaking to somebody. And I was thinking about how the typography of a poem on a page as opposed to how it's spoken can maybe and probably doesn't 
um, connect to the the relationship of, 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 of one face to another and the way that we see faces as repetitions and variations um, and, and the sort of the meaning from face to face. Interesting. So then when you're reading them face to face, you're like translating the face of the page to the face of the face. <laughs> Um, great. Those are really interesting answers. It's not really a defensible argument, but it is. <laughs> I, I like it. It's mind. really interesting. Um, and then uh, there's a question about just, uh, and maybe this is a good place for us to end our hour together, but what is something either in your own creative practice or just in your life that's helping to get you through this strange time that we're all in? Again, a question for all of you. I'll, I'll start because I started last time. Um, I've been, I mean, I've saved a, my commute time. So that's like two hours a day off the LA uh, 405 freeways. And so I've actually been writing a lot and I, and I know a lot of people haven't been able to write, but I've been on the opposite side of that spectrum of just reading um, and writing a lot. So I've just enjoyed that. And, and I don't usually watch television or any media. And I just started watching some um, <laughs> Chinese dramas on television or like, I guess you don't call it television, you call it Netflix. So um, I started watching television, I guess. And so that's been a strange process for me um, too. So that's been helpful to sort of, I guess I now understand why everybody else watches television. It takes you <laughs> away, you know? Um, so I've, that's what I've been doing. Amazing, thank you. My, my wife has been on this story for since January, so I kind of sensed that it was coming. Um, and uh, I wrote a letter to my students that you can find on LitHub called to expand the moral imagination in a time of quarantine. And um, so I'm trying to live out that practice, I suppose, of being present to this really unprecedented moment in, in our modern history and um, just writing some journal stuff, but also some poems. I, I, if I had more time, I would share one with you. Um, but uh, it, it's totally fine to, to write nothing at a time like this. Um, and, uh, you know, you should just like figure out a way to, of just um, anchoring yourself or rooting yourself in, in, and the things that sustain you. It just so happens that um, I can't help myself. Uh, and actually, like, if you're a poet, you know, write in your notebook. You don't have to write poems now. Just, like, write whatever's going on. And it, this is going to be stuff that, you know, our, our kids and grandkids or whatever, 50 years from now, people will be interested in knowing what it, what it felt like to be living now. And, you know, inshallah, we'll, we'll live through it and um, we'll see what happens next. I'm just trying to get through it. Yeah. I haven't been able to read or write. Um, it reminds me of Katrina and post-Katrina um, experiences where it's turned out, it's turned out that what poets said about Katrina experience for New Orleans, which is not really, Comparable, it's not comparable. Um, is one of the only ways that you can really capture the texture of what it felt like. I mean, the documentaries are fine, but they're dated. Data is dry. Uh, other forms of art are useful, but only poetry, I think, could capture the the texture of the moment. And both the poems written at the time, and then the poems that people who went through it have written in the years since. I went to the grave of uh, William Maxwell here in Portland, uh, his, his and his wife's um, ashes are commingled. Half of them are interred here in Portland at Riverview Cemetery by the Selwood Bridge and half in, in Connecticut. Um, partly because I've been thinking a lot about William Maxwell uh, who wrote a lot about losing his mother in the 1918 pandemic uh, beautifully and persuasively. Um, and I've been thinking about him as a, as a model for how to how a writer can remember and process and be angry and mourn and help others to mourn and grieve um, through capturing not so much, through not dismissing it, through taking it 
seriously taking notes, remembering how it feels and how it felt. Because I think afterwards, the tendency will be to uh, try to forget about it. Um, and and uh, I, I think that we can help what needs to be remembered to survive from it, just by remembering what it felt like to, you know, walk the dog, to, to be outside, to be, to talk, to try to support each other through it and not go nuts or go nuts. Safely. Interestingly, you know, but poetry has a role in the rebuilding. Poetry will have a role in the rebuilding. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all of you. Um, I can't actually imagine a better way for us to wrap up our, our uh, reading to just walk away with that phrase, poetry will have a role in the rebuilding. And I'm um, really grateful for all three of you who read, grateful for uh, those of you who hung out with us during this time, grateful for all my colleagues at Copper Canyon. Um, we are hoping that all of you, wherever you are, are well or getting there um, we're sending our love and our best to you and your families and your friends and your people and your pets and um, again you can visit coppercanyonpress.org for um, more information about the books for that list of websites uh, or that list of bookstores um, and for um, uh, information on how to donate to help support Copper Canyon. Um, we appreciate you. We love you. We'll be back on Tuesday, April 23rd at 11 o'clock Pacific time with um, Heather McHugh, James Richardson, and Sarah Rule. Thank you so much again and take care and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.